Ladies and gentlemen, please remind all participants to pay attention to the safety induction video that will be shown on the screen. Selamat datang di Hotel Santika Premier Semarang. Ini adalah video prosedur keamanan dan keselamatan di Hotel Santika Premier Semarang apabila terjadi keadaan darurat. Karena keselamatan Anda keutama. Hotel ini terdiri dari 10 lantai dengan ruang meeting di area lantai 2, ruang meeting di area lobi, dan pintu evakuasi di setiap lantainya. Dilengkapi dengan apar, sprinkler, hidra, alat pengumuman publik, dan tangga evakuasi. Apabila terjadi keadaan darurat, jangan panik dan segera keluar dari ruang. Carilah pintu darurat terdekat dan turun melalui tangga darurat. Jika Anda sedang berada di area kamar, turun melalui tangga darurat yang berada di ujung koridor setiap lantainya. Dilarang menggunakan lift dalam keadaan darurat. Jika Anda sedang berada di ruang pertemuan lantai 2, segera keluar melalui tangga darurat yang berakhir di pintu utama yang ada di lobi hotel. Dan apabila Anda sedang berada di ruang pertemuan lantai 1, segera keluar melalui pintu utama. Akan ada staf kami yang mengarahkan Anda menuju assembly point yang berada di luar gedung hotel. Setelah berada di assembly point, pastikan Anda dan orang-orang di sekitar anda selamat. Khusus apabila terjadi gempa bumi, segeralah menjauh dari kaca jendela dan barang-barang pecah belah agar Anda terhindar dari pecahan kaca. Jauhi juga barang-barang besar yang berpotensi untuk jatuh dan menimpa Anda. Carilah tempat yang aman untuk perlindungan seperti meja dan melindungi kepala Anda dengan bantal. Apabila Anda tertimpa reruntuhan, buatlah keributan seperti memukul batu atau besi di sekitar Anda untuk menarik perhatian. Terima kasih atas kepercayaan Anda kepada Hotel Santika Premier Semarang. Hospitality from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin by singing the Indonesian anthem, Indonesia Raya. For a brief moment, we would like to invite all of you to rise and sing together. Attendees are requested to stay. Hospitality from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin by singing the Indonesian anthem, Indonesia Raya. For a brief moment, we would like to invite all of you to rise and sing together. Attendees are requested to
Attendees are welcome to return to their seats. As a part of our welcoming greetings, we'd like to showcase a traditional dance to welcome our guests. It's done in a dance called Gambang Semarang. Please welcome Gambang Dance by UKM Kesenian Universitas Diponegoro. As a part of our welcoming greetings, We'd like to showcase a traditional dance to welcome our guests. Gambang Semarang. It's is a Semarangan art in performance that was Gambang initiated Semarang. by Semarang residents, developed in the Gambang Semarang dance area, dance and contains Semarang characteristics. Gambang Semarang is also an art of cultural acculturation between Chinese and Japanese ethnicities. This dance is expected to unify Gambang and preserve Semarang. the existing in culture and art in Semarang City that was Gambang initiated Semarang. by Semarang residents, developed in the Semarang area and contains Semarang Sampai <laughs> Mereka Terima Semua orang karena hati 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 si tukang kerja. Datri si tukang kerja. Semarang cari tukang Soko tembung kutong pasemearan Pati-pati menggang gondang nges mandeng Gangka kali <laughs> Jossu 
Let's give a round of applause to UKM Kesenian Universitas Diponegoro for outstanding performance. Thank you. Let's get on to the next item on the agenda. The chairperson of ITNIS 2023 will offer the first welcome speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to welcome Professor Dr. Insinyur R. Rizal Isnanto, ST, MM, MT, IPU ASEAN Engineer. To the next item on the agenda. The chairperson of ITNIS 2023 will offer the first welcome speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to welcome. on energy, environment, epidemiology, and information systems, or ITNIS 2023. We set our goal to run this conference to be conducted annually. The main objective is to provide a platform for academic, academician, researchers, engineers, and professionals from anywhere in the world to expose and exchange innovative ideas disseminate and discuss their research updates in relation to the aspects of energy, environment, epidemiology, information systems, as well as multidisciplinary topics. ITNIS 2023 has the theme of empowering information systems in the field of energy, health, and environment to face society 5.0. In this event, we invited seven keynote speakers from several countries to present superior topics. They are Prof. Dr. Nur Ismawati bin Jafar from University of Malaya, Malaysia, Assistant Professor Dr. Seng Tuen Munsom from Mahidol University, Thailand, Professor Alfonso J. Rodriguez Morales from Institución Universitaria Vision de las Americas, Colombia, Professor Peter Jell from Federation University Australia, Dr. Tomoya Katauka from Graduate School of Science Engineering, Ehime University, Japan, Professor Dr. Insur Hadianto from School of Postgraduate Studies, Udisa Jiponegoro, Semarang, Indonesia, and Professor Insur Paulus Insap Santoso from Kacamada University, Indonesia. Unfortunately, uh, Prof. Insap could not attend this conference due to his un unwell condition. This year, we have received 226 submissions to be exact from various universities, research centers, as well as from industries from 10 countries. Those are from Japan, Australia, Iran, Iraq, Malaysia, Thailand, Colombia, Ethiopia, Timor-Leste, as well as from Indonesia. After careful reviews, we selected 184 papers to be presented in this conference. All the accepted and presented papers will be submitted for uploading to the E3S Web of Conferences proceedings. We thank all authors and parties who have contributed and participated in presenting their works at this conference. 
We also gratefully acknowledge all reviewers from the respected knowledge from members of conference committee from Indonesia and abroad. Their efforts were crucial to the success of the conference. We are also blessed by the presence of six invited keynote speakers from different institutions, which will address significant trends relating to energy, environment, epidemiology, information systems, as well as multidisciplinary topics. At last, we wish you all enjoying a two days discussions through this conference and spend time to feel the beauty of Semarang City and its surroundings. Thank you and very best regards. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Rizal. The next welcome speech will be delivered by the Dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies. We would kindly invite the Dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies, Dr. R.B. Sularto, SHM Hum, to deliver the welcome speech and officially launch this great conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Rector Diponegoro University, who not be able to join because of another activities, he said he said. His forgiveness and give warming greeting to all of you. It is the conference that held for the first time that held offline since we had situation in pandemic of COVID-19. As we know, pandemic of COVID-19 was ended on Friday, May 5th, 2023 by what organization statement. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 8th International Conference of Energy, Environment, Epidemiology and Information System or at Chinese 2023, organized by School of Postgraduate Studies, Diponegoro University. The international conference is a part of conference, seminar, and workshop activities provided by the School of Postgraduate Studies, Diponegoro University. Ichenis 2023 bring out the ideas and uh, research in the field of energy, environment, epidemiology, and information system toward sustainable development. This conference promote new approach and innovation in affirmation field, all its support of creating sustainable energy and technology without depleting natural resources. The objective of the Chinese 2023 are, one, creating an international forum for the researcher, student, industries, and government to communicate their research 
result on the fundamental and application on energy, environment, epidemiology, and information system. Two, second and exchange ideas, thought, and discussion on all aspects of energy, environment, and phenomenology, and information system. And the last, facilitating the formation of network among participants to enhance the quality and benefit of research and development. Furthermore, this conference also constitute a great opportunity for escalating collaboration among institutions in terms of various academic necessities. At all, I would like to thank the keynote speaker to for allowing us to change to experience quality sharing. It is at essential to gather expert in the field of science and technology to improve the quality of postgraduate education. Thank you and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We would like to invite the first vice dean and the second vice dean and also Mr. Rizal as a chairperson to accompany the dean to officially launch this event with the bidding of the gong. Thank you. You may return to your seat. We will now pause for a moment of reflection. Abdillah Baraja is welcome to lead us in a prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, let us bow our head for a moment, pray to God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that our international conference can be precious to all of us. I will lead this prayer based on the teaching of Islam and those who are not Muslim, you are pleased to pray according to each of all your beliefs. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Hamdan Shakirin, Hamdan Naimin. الحمد يوافي نعمه ويكافي مزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك الكريم وعظيم سلطانك اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا معنا شقيا ولا مطرودا ولا محروما ربنا هب لنا مسيئنا لمحسننا ومقصرنا لعاملنا وهب لنا الكل لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين. Oh Allah, this morning in this beautiful place, 
we gather here to bring about an international conference on energy, environment, epidemiology, and inform information system. Make this conference as a useful science assembly, as a medium of sharing useful ideas, knowledge, and experiences of scholars, researchers, and students of various disciplines. May the conference we organize today benefit to our lives, broaden our knowledge, shine our ideas, and lead us to be successful, productive persons, which in turn will boost dignity of our nation. O oh Allah, guide and bless our hearts and our minds with the light of all your guidance. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities. Help us to speak our minds clearly. Help us to listen to each other, respect each other, love each other, so that we are included to the blessed persons. O oh Allah, protect us from unintended temptation. Show us the right path and give us knowledge and strength to perform good things equally. Show us and make it clear the bad things and give us knowledge and strength to avoid them. O oh Allah, you are the one who can fulfill our prayer. Rabbana taqabbal minna du'a'ana innaka anta samiul alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabur rahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Abila. Now we'll have a picture shoot and hand over the plaque. We would like to invite keynote speakers, the dean and the chairperson to come on the stage and have photo shoot. For the first place, kindly be invited to the stage. I love the speakers. I love the keynote speakers. Okay, and then the second place, we would like to invite the Dean, Vice Dean, and the levels of the School of Postgraduate Academy community. Please come onto the stage and take a photo with all of the keynote speakers. For the last group, kindly be invited to the stage, I Sinis 2023 participant. Please to all of the participants come onto the stage to take a picture with all of the keynote speaker and the special invitation.
the timbrel set the position of the participation, the participant. Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Attendees are welcome to return to your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at our primary agenda item, the plenary session. The speakers for today are Professor Dr. Nur Ismawati Binti Jafar from University Malaya, Malaysia. Professor Alfonso J. Rodriguez Morales from Institution Universitaria Vision de las Americas in Colombia. And also Professor Peter Jell from Federation University, Australia. Before we continue to our next agenda, we will coffee break in 10 minutes. Please to all participants to take your coffee break in front of the room.
The postgraduates of Dipono Garo University carry out international education for the development of science and technology. Visi Sekolah Pasca Sarjana tahun 2020-2024 adalah menjadi sekolah pasca sarjana bertaraf internasional yang unggul dan terkemuka dengan mengintegrasikan bidang keilmuan multidisiplin. Misi sekolah pasca sarjana, satu, meningkatkan kualitas dan kuantitas pendidikan pasca sarjana multidisiplin, sehingga menghasilkan lulusan yang mempunyai keunggulan kompetitif, komparatif secara internasional dan berkontribusi pada pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan, teknologi, dan seni. Dua, meningkatkan kualitas dan kuantitas penelitian dan publikasi sebagai upaya pengembangan ilmu, teknologi, dan seni dengan mengedepankan budaya dan sumber daya teknis lokal dengan pendekatan multi, intra, dan interdisiplin. Ketiga, meningkatkan kualitas dan kuantitas pengabdian kepada masyarakat sebagai upaya penerapan dan pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan, teknologi, dan seni melalui pendekatan multi, intra, dan interdisiplin. Postgraduates of the Onagaro University facilitate students from multidisciplines to develop their capabilities and capacities as academic or professional. Sebagai bentuk respon terhadap perubahan zaman serta perkembangan ilmu pengetahuan yang begitu cepat, maka Sekolah Pasar Sarjana Universitas Diponegoro hadir untuk meningkatkan kualitas sumber daya manusia yang unggul dan kompetitif baik di skala nasional maupun global. Tuntutan dunia usaha serta industri memberikan persoalan-persoalan yang kompleks dan hanya dapat diselesaikan dengan penguatan pola pembelajaran multi dan interdisiplin keilmuan. Bentuk respon terhadap perubahan perkembangan zaman, maka sekolah pasar sarjana melakukan reorientasi kurikulum dan pembelajaran di tiap prodinya. Kurikulum dikembangkan untuk lebih fleksibel melalui dua jalur pembelajaran, yaitu program by course dan by research. Saat ini kami mengelola program studi multidisiplin di antaranya program magister dan doktor ilmu lingkungan, program magister doktor sistem informasi, program magister epidemiologi, dan program magister energi. Bagian sumber daya dan inovasi di Sekolah Pasar Sarjana bertanggung jawab terhadap sarana dan prasarana termasuk sumber daya manusia dan tentu saja dengan pengembangan inovasi. Terkait dengan sarana-prasarana, kami memiliki dua gedung kembar, demikian juga untuk gedung lama yang juga ada di bawah manajemen SPS. Mahasiswa berhak menggunakan fasilitas yang ada di SPS, tapi juga berhak menggunakan fasilitas yang ada di universitas. Terkait dengan sumber daya manusia, SPS memang tidak memiliki dosen tetap, tetapi kami memiliki dosen home base dan ajang profesor dari luar negeri yang setiap tahun datang ke Indonesia, ke Semarang untuk memberikan kuliah, pendampingan terhadap mahasiswa, demikian juga untuk mengembangkan penelitian bersama. Hasil dari kolaborasi penelitian tersebut terkaitkan dengan pengembangan inovasi yang itu sudah dipublish di beberapa jurnal internasional bereputasi dan itu memberikan capaian indikator terhadap sekolah pasca sarjana. Kemudian terkait di aspek manajemen, SPS juga memulai untuk menjadi leader di dalam penjaminan mutu dengan sudah tersertifikasi ISO 9001. Kemudian terkait dengan aspek keselamatan kerja, SPS juga sudah tersertifikasi 45001. Demikian juga di aspek sistem pengelolaan lingkungan sudah tersertifikasi ISO 14001. Dengan demikian, maka dengan tiga sistem penjaminan mutu ini diharapkan mahasiswa baik nasional 
nasional maupun internasional uh, sudah tidak asing lagi karena apa yang kami kembangkan di SPS ini sudah uh, mengacu dan mengikuti apa yang terjadi di skala internasional. The Environmental Science Study Program develops the concept of science and technology in the field of environmental sciences for an environmental sustainable development. Development must not only focus on economic growth, but also the environmental aspects. Energy Study Program. This study program was established to produce graduates who can apply science and technology in the energy field to contribute to the acceleration and development of the energy industry. Graduates of this study program are also expected to be able to provide various solutions to the energy problems in the community. Epidemiology Study Program. This study program develops an education that produces epidemiology graduates with managerial advantages through a One Health approach. The students and the lecturers perform research, publications, and intellectual works who can offer real solutions in the field of epidemiology. Information System Study Program. The Information System Study Program was established to produce scientific and professionals at national and international levels. The main focus of the study program in various activities of Tri Dharma Higher Education is developing and applying digital technology and information systems in various fields. In implementing research and service to the community, The lecturers and the postgraduate students of Diponegoro University have their hands down directly into the field to discover new findings and apply them in the community. Dissemination of research results and community service in the postgraduates of Diponegoro University is also carried out by conducting annual international seminars which are attended by various scientists from many countries in the world. Postgraduate students of the Ponagoro University are facilitated with various learning needs, such as comfortable classrooms and computer laboratories for data processing. Adequate laboratory as a research support means for the lecturers and students. with a decent book collection. I am Professor Peter Gill and I am adjunct professor in environmental science in the School of Postgraduate Studies at Dipanagora University. With students, we examine the changes evident from indicators preserved within the sediments of the lake. We regularly publish these outcomes and introduce them to the World Wide Archive of Studies on the impact of people on wetlands. At Dipo Nagori University, they also give lectures and seminars and work with students on their projects in environmental science. Uh, my primary areas of specialization are in water and sediment quality, and I also deal with the restoration remediation of contaminated rivers. 
uh, during the past several years, I've participated in a collaborative exchange program uh, with Undeep. Uh, during this time, we've been able to have uh, students and faculty visit Western Carolina University, and I had the honor of visiting Undeep uh, a few years ago. And during my visit, um, I was able to um, interact with a wide variety of both students and faculty. Uh, I was able to share a, a workshop on sediment and water quality during that time. And then I really got to know some of the area. And from that, we uh, was, were able to develop some collaborative research projects that we're uh, continuing to work on. And I believe once COVID subsides and perhaps we have a vaccine, we'll be able to expand, the, expand these types of collaborative uh, efforts in the future. During this time of globalization and kind of global environmental problems, I think uh, these types of uh, collaborative and um, global exchange programs are absolutely critical for both faculty and students to participate in. So I hope to uh, see some of you in the future. And with that, I'll stop. My specialism is in nuclear techniques in order to date archaeological and fossil materials. Uh, I work at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, and uh, my specialism is in the dating methods using those nuclear techniques. I'm really interested in uh, the environmental history, uh, in particularly Java. It has, we have a lot to learn from past uh, climate and environmental changes and how we can deal with them in the future. So if you have an interesting project, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I have an email address here at ANSTO, and or you can ask uh, Professor Tri Sukrubawati. Now I'm studying Master of Epidemiology in University of Ponegro. I choose UNDIP because UNDIP is among the best universities in the world. And secondly, they have a good Master of Epidemiology. When I say it's a good one, because they have good laboratory settings. They also have uh, uh, good lecturers. They are professional. And anything you need to do a research in UNDIP is there. I really recommend other for me to come in to study in because it's a good space and a good environment for studying. So I say others are welcome. In the language we do be a barrier because you're going to learn it in a very short period of time. I just think Master Epidemiology in Diponegori University because one of the mission is conducting research based in the community service and conducting research uh, in the field of the epi epidemiology that produce publication, policy recommendation, and intervention innovation. Postgraduates of the Ponogoro University carry out international education for the development of science and technology. Visi Sekolah Pasca Sarjana Tahun 2020. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Our next agenda will begin in a few minutes. Please have a nice seat and back to your position.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at our primary agenda item, the plenary session. The speakers for today are Professor Dr. Nur Ismawati binti Jafar from University Malaya, Malaysia. Professor Alfonso J. Rodriguez Morales from Institution Universitaria Vision Glass America in Colombia. Also, Professor Peter Gell from Federation University, Australia. Professor Dr. Insinyur Hadianto, STMSC IPU, will moderate all presentation and discussion. Please allow me to read his brief biography. He is Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs of Postgraduate Diponegoro University. He's got his Bachelor Degree of Chemical Engineering at Diponegoro University in 1998. He's got, he got his Master's Degree in 2003 and his Doctor of Philosophy in 2007 at Wageningen University, Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Professor Dr. Insinyur Hadianto, STMSC, IPU. Time is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, MC. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm honored to be the chairman uh, for this uh, keynote uh, speaker sessions, the first day. And before we start, I would like to invite the speakers, uh, Professor Nur Ismawati and also Professor Peter Chell to come to the stage. Please. <coughs> Please give applause to those. Yeah, actually we have uh, three uh, cannot speakers today, but uh, Rob Alfonso, uh, he's not able uh, physically uh, in front of us. So he will be joining with us uh, using Zoom uh, mode. I hope uh, he's already joined with us. Uh, can you check? Okay. Uh, while waiting, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, COVID-19 is already over. <laughs> About uh, three ago, we uh, have uh, suffered of uh, this pandemic. COVID-19 and it impact to many aspects, including, oh, <laughs> yeah, including uh, health and also economic and environment and also uh, energy. And all this impact as a disadvantage to our society. And today, uh, in line to the theme of this uh, conference, uh, empowering environment and environment system in the field of energy, health, and environment to face society 5.0. Uh, uh, we have uh, three honorable speakers. The first one is Prof. Nur Iswati from uh, University Malaya. And the second is Professor Peter Gell from Federation University Australia. And also Professor Alfonso Rodriguez Morales from uh, Foundation Universitaria Autonoma, the last Americas, Colombia. Uh, before we start, I would like to, uh, yeah, to briefly uh, introduce uh, speakers uh, CV. The first one is Professor Dr. Nur Ismawati Jafar. Uh, professor Nur is a professor at the Faculty of Business and Economic University Malaya, Malaysia, and she obtained her Doctor of Business Administration. Uh, qualification from Macquarie Graduate School of Management, uh, Australia, and she holds uh, several certifications uh, 
programs and she teach accounting information system and uh, this is really fit well to our uh, study program in information systems. Uh, she has been invited as a visiting professor, guest lecturer, keynote speakers, and presenter for a symposium and conference uh, in Australia, China, and India, uh, as well as in Indonesia. And also, uh, surprisingly, Prof. Noor is actually come from Java, especially from Kebumen. But she couldn't speak Napa. Yeah, the second uh, speaker, uh, I have to look at the CP, <laughs> uh, Professor Peter Chell. Uh, professor Peter Chell is actually uh, our adjunct professor in environmental sciences uh, uh, program, uh, School of Postgraduate Study, and he is uh, originally from Federation University Australia. And every year, uh, Prof. Peter Chell come to our school uh, to give uh, lecture and also doing some activity of research and some student also has uh, has a discussion with the professor uh, Peter Chell for uh, their uh, thesis or for dissertation research and then for uh, Professor Alfonso Morales uh, Morales is an expert in tropical and emerging disease particularly zoonotic and vector uh, born disease and uh, he is the president of the publication and research committee of the Pan America Infection Disease Association (AP), as well as the president of the Colombian Association of Infection uh, Disease. Uh, things, if I read all the CP, uh, it will take uh, two hours. So let's start our first uh, speakers. Uh, Prof. Nur is Yeah. Uh, the first speaker and the time is yours. Right. Can I start now, Prof. Hadi? Um, thank you very much, Prof, for the introduction. So I think I better go at the rostrum. Uh, before I begin, Sugeng Rawu, everyone. Is that right? which means welcome to the 8th uh, Iconist Conference. I'm very honoured to be on stage today to be uh, talking about my topic for today's presentations. So I can see there are many faces, yeah, uh, researchers, academicians and potential uh, students who are very interested in doing research here. Yeah? Um, so before I begin, thank you very much again to Prof. Hadi as the uh, moderator, uh, the Dean of the Institute of Postgraduate Studies, the Deputy Deans, my respected uh, audience and uh, students, um, thank you once again for being with me today. Yeah. Okay, so I need to do this. Yeah. Sorry, it's loading. Yeah. Ah, maybe then. I hope you all are awake with that introduction, just to give you a little bit of heads up so that you are actually paying attention to what I'm going to talk about today. Yeah? So basically, my topic is about uh, digital economy, how uh, we are using ICT to actually catalyze uh, the digital economy. Yeah? So we are looking from uh, atoms to bits and bits to atoms, right? So they are very uh, much interchangeable and we are living in a world where these two atoms and bits 
you cannot actually run away from them. Yeah. So it's actually a complementary uh, elements of our uh, living nowadays. Yeah. So basically, uh, these are the things that I'm going to talk about, and I only have about thirty minutes. Okay. I may have to speed up a little bit, but we can actually address your concern, or if you have any questions, we can address it during the Q and A session and the discussion later on. Yeah. Now, um, moving forward, um, what is the status of the digital economy nowadays, according to countries? So I put up a little bit of uh, statistics and numbers with regards to the status of each country with regards to their GDP, how much digital economy actually contributed to their gross domestic product, right? So it's uh, feeling a little bit odd. Can I just walk around? Yeah, okay. Um, so if you look at some of the indicators, uh, countries, uh, especially in the Southeast Asian, like Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Thailand, they have shown some incredible, incredible figures with regards to the development. And uh, if you compare with the more developed countries like uh, America, right? So we can see that digital economy is becoming more pervasive in our current environment with regards to the development of each country. Yeah. Now, um, what is the importance of digital economy? I would say it's more or towards its contribution to the businesses and also uh, how they can actually uh, engage to more, um, you know, a larger uh, customers. They can also uh, be more efficient in terms of doing business and they can actually reduce cost with regards to what they can offer, yeah? Now, um, moving forward again, there are many things, of course, that we need to do with regards to how do we ensure each country would actually be sustainable with regards to facing uh, the issues or challenges of digital economy, yeah? It doesn't work. Maybe I need to go to come back to the stage where it can work. Okay, right. So what is digital economy per se? I'm sure all of you have heard what is the term uh, all about. Okay, and there is actually no universal definitions of digital economy. Um, like Malaysia actually defines it with regards to economical and uh, social activities which involve productions of the use of digital technology. Now, uh, of course, it encompasses individuals, the society, and also the government, right? So in digital economy, digital technology remains as the basic foundations in uh, defining the economy as a whole, okay? Right, so there are many definitions. Uh, some have been defined by the Digital Economy Task Force and also the Asian Development Banks. If you look at their definitions of digital economy, basically it talks about activities using digitized information and you can see the effective use of information technology and also how it promotes productivity and economic structure, yeah? So we can also see things like internet, cloud computing, big data, fintech, and the other new digital technologies are also used to collect, store, and analyze information digitally, yeah? So all of these would actually transform the social interactions, all right? So now digital economy can also be related to the other terms like gig economy, platform economy, sharing economy, and also digital services, yeah? All right. Now, if you look at the representations of digital economy as a whole, in the broader terms, we have what we call the digital, uh, digitalized economy, and um, digital economy is part of it in the middle, yeah? But um, if you look at the core, what is the component of digital economy, you can see it's still very much related to the ICT with regards to the hardware, network, um, and also information services, yeah? So we cannot actually have what we call uh, an economic, which is actually relying on technology to ensure there is a transactions and communications in all the parties without having the core components, right? So if you can see that the elements of digital economy is very much related to things like IT itself, information technology, the digital platform, 
okay, the gig economy and also the impact to the retail uh, businesses. Okay, now I push the forward button, it goes back. Okay, so if you look at some of the main components of digital economy, again, it actually focuses on three things, e-business infrastructure, e-business and also e-commerce. If you talk about infrastructure, that's where your information communication uh, technology comes into the picture. Things like hardware, networking, those are actually the underlying platform that makes up the e-business and e-commerce. Yeah? When we talk about e-business, that is the relationships among the corporations and also society. And the e-commerce itself is when there is a proper fulfillment of, of the goods that's being transferred with regards to the businesses yeah now that's the main uh, components and if you look at the key attributes of an economic which is digitalized we focus on a few important things like ubiquity meaning that um, digital economy is actually operating to a variety of channels including the internet mobile devices and also digital platforms so we can also see that Interconnectivity is also important with regards to digital economy, right? So having uh, everyone highly interconnected with digital devices is very important to ensure there is seamless uh, communication and collaboration among the users in the digital economy. Yeah. Now the third uh, key attribute is with regards to mobility. The fourth one is personalizations because in digital economy we focus on experience. Yeah, how do you actually, um, you know, um, buy things online, right? For example, that is actually more on the elements of how do you feel about having that experience of purchasing uh, something towards a different platform as opposed to our physical uh, inter, inter our transactions, yeah? And the fifth one is actually socializations because uh, digital economy facilitates interaction and collaboration among users that fosters sense of community and connection, right? So these are the most important uh, elements of any economic, which uh, we will, uh, and in fact, we are actually experiencing uh, this environment right now. Okay, now um, next slide is actually talking about the trends and also what are the enablers of digital economy. You can see that on the left, we have uh, models like how people are doing business, Things like uh, fintech, digital content, e-commerce, trade, um, cloud kitchen, yeah, uh, vacation rentals, right hailing. Those are the things that are coming up nowadays as a business model, as opposed to the previous face-to-face uh, -face, uh, business transactions. Yeah, there are many things uh, where uh, people are actually doing things right now, which is more. Uh, advanced and more digitalized and things are very much um, done in a very speedy uh, environment. Yeah? Now, if you look at on the right hand side, the one in orange, we talk about what are the imaging technologies. We cannot run away from all this. You can see that being able to transact or doing anything online, you require certain technology or um, infrastructures, things like the 5G, the communications, the cloud, the uh, IoT, big data analytics and also robotics are coming uh, into the picture. Yeah, So we cannot run away from having all these uh, imaging technologies. And if you look at the things that enable this to happen, things like a strategy and regulations, the digital infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, you cannot run away from that. You need to have a proper infrastructure in order for you to be in a fully digital economic environment. Okay, The third one is data. That is also very important nowadays. And of course, with regards to the users, you need what we call digital skills that will actually enhance the uh, proper seamless communications among the users of digital economy. Yeah. So the trends of digital economy nowadays is uh, focusing more on digital business model and it provides, um, we are shifting from services to more experiences and it also gives an impact to the industry where there is a creation of what we call ecosystems. Yeah. Now, um, right? So again, what is the role of ICT in a digital economy, right? So you can see that ICT industry is the backbone 
that underpins the digital economy and it serves as a predictor of a digital economy as a whole. Yeah? So we need technology, we need people who are knowledgeable about using the technology and we also need some of the regulations, uh, even support from the government to ensure that we achieve the uh, digital economic status. Yeah. Right. So um, the future, how the future is going to be, um, we will rely a lot of uh, robotics. We will rely also on artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, Internet of things, those are becoming more uh, prevalent nowadays. And these are the areas that a digital economy would actually foster and help a country to be uh, more sustainable in the future. All right. So uh, this is quite an interesting thing that I found out with regards to how uh, the atoms are actually going to bits and the bits are going back to, to atoms. So we cannot run away from these two worlds. Okay? The atom is actually you know, the physical part where we okay, um, are actually working all together, parallel worlds. One is reality, which is the atoms, and the other one is actually the digital comprised of bits made up of ones and zeros, yeah? Now, this is what we call dematerializations, where we convert physical into um, bits or digital, yeah? So this is uh, an interesting concept, which I actually uh, found out uh, that can actually be explained with regards to what is happening to our uh, societies nowadays, yeah? Dematerializations. On the other hand, you also cannot run away from Okay, when we convert the digital back to atoms or physical, yeah. Okay, for example, if you print a photo, okay, on a classical printer, and also when you play your uh, music from digital devices, okay, things like a three D print, for example, would actually enable you to go back to reality by reconverting uh, atoms into. Uh, what we call a process of materializations, yeah? So these are two important things which I found very interesting and um, can actually be a proper research where we can know what are the, um, the important trends that is happening right now and what are the things that ICT can do with regards to facilitating this, yeah? Now, there is also um, what we call the fading boundary between atoms and also bits, and it requires okay, actuators and also sensors if you actually want to convert atoms to bits and bits back to, to atoms. Yeah? So we are actually in the loop, and um, we cannot really differentiate between atoms and also bits. Yeah? So it, these two must actually go together. Okay, now uh, with that, um, we cannot also run away from what we call innovation and also techno culture. Um, innovation is very important in any organizations. We talk about how things are done differently with the uh, advancement and also the facilitations of ICT. Some things can be done much faster and more efficient if you use technology. Yeah? So uh, innovation that is very, very important in any way, in any type of organizations. And when you talk about techno culture, this is also impacting our society. When you talk about techno culture, it is actually how the cultural practices have been um, enhanced or have been changed as a form of using uh, ICT. Yeah? So it is more like facilitating the cultural communications and how they actually come across space and also time. Yeah? So that's techno culture. And it is happening in our society nowadays. We do things differently. We talk to each other differently. We meet differently. And also we attend conference differently, right? We used to con attend conference physical, right? But now you can be anywhere. Even the speakers can be anywhere. And still they are able to convey or deliver uh, what they want to talk about in the sessions, yeah? So many things, and it is becoming very, very much embedded into our lives so that we cannot run away from it and we have to embrace technology. I would say that um, you really cannot run away from uh, having to use technology and uh, the things that what you can do is actually embrace it and enjoy it rather than running away from the, the use of technology, okay? 
Right, so that's actually innovations and also a little bit on uh, techno culture. Now, uh, when, uh, where does innovation actually happens? It can be um, in you, in the individual, in the team, organizations, or also the, size, the society as a whole. Yeah? Now, um, I have an interesting slide, I mean pictures with regard to techno culture. You can see also how things have changed. Right, um, as I mentioned earlier, digital economy also refers to gig economy. You understand what is gig economy? Okay, whereby we no longer depends on people who are having permanent jobs. We rely on those who are having uh, occupations or work as a gig, you know, short or contractual kind of things. So you can see that we have delivery guys, you know, riding a motorbike that send food to your homes. And we can also see that how a mother Okay, you can see there is a mother and uh, she actually spent some time. I cannot go back. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. So uh, a mother who actually have a toddler at home still would able to do work. Okay. So that's the other things that are changing the society also. Practices and also common uh, things that we used to do physically now uh, is becoming more and more interesting, becoming more virtual and things can also be done from remote, yeah? Now, um, another picture. Um, do you, can you actually gauge what this is all about? Okay, Peter, it's written in Bahasa. So it means to say that, sayang, I'm home, that one you know, you understand, right? <laughs> okay, lagi lima jam pergi kerja lagi. So this is the impact of also gig economy per se. When you talk about digital economy, um, some people may actually opt for conducting or having more than one job, right? Where, you know, they have the opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, uh, it actually results in people uh, don't, don't, not having enough sleep, not having enough uh, time with the family, and they actually have to go back again. So they come back very late at night and they need to go back again very early in the morning. Okay, so that is actually happening also where people have more than one job, yeah, multiple uh, occupations. So that is the impact on uh, society and techno culture. Okay, now way forward, I'm actually going, uh, you know, reaching uh, the last few points of my uh, presentations. So um, what is the impact of digital economy? Um, I would say more on the opportunities that it offers with regards to employment. So that is one. You can see that um, it focuses on certain economic sectors like e-commerce, online travels, and things like, um, you know, there is a growth with regards of companies like um, Gojek, Grab, for example, Netflix, okay, with regards to the number of their teams, which will increase 10% per year. And you can see also digital economy would impact um, creating 100,000 skilled professionals and 4 million partners. And of course, when you talk about flexible or gig workers, you can see that the numbers is increasing into threefold. It is expected that by 2025, the numbers would actually increase, yeah? Okay, um, yeah, having all this, we can see that there are also challenges if you want to achieve a fully digital economic status, right? Things like infrastructure, you cannot run away from that. Certain parts of the uh, society in a country would actually have better access to technology as opposed to some of the more rural or even those areas which are, are having uh, lesser connectivity. Yeah? Digital and computer skills is also very important with regards to uh, ensuring how the users or the actors in an economy would actually be uh, participating in the activities. We have also issues with regard to digital divide. The more technology that you introduce would actually mean some people would not have access to them and they may actually be left behind. Yeah? So that will create a greater digital divide among the society. And you can also see issues with regard to cyber crimes which is uh, also very important if you want to make sure that your economy will achieve digital economic status. Now, um, as a conclusions, yeah, conclusions, 
digitalization digitization will continue it will not stop here so um, there is also a blurring world between a digital world and also where uh, your atom actually begins and uh, we do not want to be in a world where we are imprisoned in uh, the digital world but at the same time we forgot that we exist in the um, the the atom or the physical uh, environment yeah uh, we are ourselves made of atoms and therefore okay the digital um, would actually remain okay no matter how much it is um, you know cannot be distinguished it is actually an emulation of reality right so i would also conclude digital economy will continue to evolve Okay, and it has to be actually done digitally um, responsibly and also uh, innovatively to leverage the full potential of digital economy in the years to come, right? Now, the question that prevails is how resilient are we? Because things keep on changing, okay? We have to do things, we have to learn to do uh, communication, we have to do things differently and we cannot stop at one point, right? So um, with that, I actually uh, and would like to end my presentation, Matur uh, Suwun, and I hope everybody would actually have a fruitful uh, conference. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Nur, Matur Nuhun. Yeah, uh, it's very uh, interesting uh, speech and inspiring uh, for us. Uh, we can see that, uh, yeah, we start now the digitalization and uh, Prof. Nur said the digital, uh, digitalization is uh, unstop unstoppable. So we have to live with that, right? <laughs> we cannot avoid that, but we have to live with that. So uh we also uh, got the mission that uh, digital economy can reduce the cost of uh, the production marketing and also distribution but i'm sure uh, there are a lot of uh, questions from the audience uh, but uh, please keep it we will have a qa session after all the speaker are keeping uh, their lecture uh, we move to the second speakers uh, prof peter Jell. Now, uh, Prof. Peter Chell will uh, will uh, speech on uh, environmental management and as uh, his expert also in this uh, area. Prof. Peter, okay, the time is yours. Thank you, Marianto. <clears throat> okay, I'm uh, a an ecologist, paleoecologist, and. <clears throat> So I tend to work on individual sites and try to understand the ecology of individual sites. I'll try and impress on you that there is much more to be learned by bringing together multiple workers with multiple sites and using <clears throat> data systems to up the scale, both in time and in space, to better understand how the system has changed, that is an ecosystem has changed, and to better attribute the causes of those changes so that you can mitigate uh, the impacts. So <clears throat> ecosystems change naturally uh, owing to <clears throat> natural drivers such as climate uh, and also, of course, due to people. And there's some good examples in both uh, <clears throat> Australia and Africa and in Indonesia of those sorts of human impacts. Uh, and the ecosystems themselves might respond quite differently to the different forces that are brought upon them, whether they be natural or human. So there might be some resistance. Uh, there might be a threshold change such that there's resistance up to a point and then the sudden change. Um, and the drivers might be counteractive. So one driver might offset another. And so the impact is reduced or they might be synergistic and they might act together and suddenly create a, an unexpectedly large response in the natural environment. 
And then to understand the drivers, we need to recognise that some of those are very local and it might just be local overgrazing or um, clearance of uh, riverside vegetation. It might be regional where you have drought or it might be global uh, and warming and drying and increased intensity of storms is something we'll be having to increasingly consider in the future. <clears throat> So I just presented here in a, in a chapter a few years ago, that in fact, if we consider all the drivers down the right-hand side, uh, interdecadal Pacific oscillation is a large-scale climate driver, temperature anomaly increasing gradually, sediment infilling in a wetland, increasing nutrient loads, and then episodes of flood and drought from say 1870 through to the present, uh, that the wetland is actually a function of all of those. And it might have a unregulated phase in its early stages, but it might also now in blue be regulated. And so its responses will be quite different. So as you can see immediately that uh, understanding the drivers and the responses can be quite complex. So understanding change for management, <clears throat> uh, at the local scale, direct causes uh, might be easily managed. You can turn off an effluent pipe into a wetland uh, and it will uh, stop increasing in nutrient load. Uh, regional and diffuse scale are more complex, harder to identify and less easily solved. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but misidentifying the nature and scale of the problem risks exacerbating the problem. If you think it's a local problem uh, and you invest in solving a local problem, when in fact it's a regional one, you'll have no response uh, after your investment. Uh, and that's a poor investment of effort. So we waste resources and dollars. And sometimes if you implement the wrong measure, you create um, disharmony in the community and they are no longer as cooperative as they might have been. So <clears throat> sometimes we need to think of long-term to understand where we're at at a particular point in time. And this is a diagram around Ramsar listing, Ramsar being a United Nations, originally United Nations program about the preservation of wetlands, identifying a particular point uh, that you want to keep that wetland to. So time of listing, as I've put there. And I've tried to track in blue, uh, the change that might've happened to that wetland through time from the left across to the right. And you might be measuring it in the middle there, and it seems as if it's within a fairly comfortable range of variability for management. But in fact, it's tracking a long-term trajectory of change, which will ultimately lead it into a new state. So we need to understand this pathway of change to understand what the drivers are and what actions we need to put in place and whether we need to put in place any actions. So a range of approaches in environmental science critically include monitoring, to understand change, but nearly always monitoring programs have been put in very late and very few sites around the world have been monitored in any great detail. Some sites, Hubbard Brook in the US has 60 years of monitoring, but that's exceptional. Uh, <clears throat> monitoring for management assumes the site was unimpacted as, as you started the monitoring, where in fact we know there are many impacts that started decades, even centuries ago. So we need to recognize that even at the start of our monitoring, the system is not as it was. Site monitoring, uh, monitoring assumes links between what is measured, water quality and biota. And so you're uh, a priori assuming that you know what the driver is. Uh, local site monitoring, as I said, might overlook regional or global drivers of change. And we need to remember, as I just said, that global ecosystems have been impacted by people for a long time. And we've published a paper in Anthropocene Review showing that the first impacts of people on wetlands around the world probably started around five or 6,000 years ago. Uh, not, not in the last 100 years in the Great Acceleration, but for a very long time. So it's very hard to distinguish recent effects from long-term legacy effects. And there's an illustration from that paper showing that uh, here, 
as early as 6,000 years ago, we're getting impacts. And even in some places, 9,000 years ago, impacts in terms of salinity uh, or nutrients or sedimentation. And in fact, the impacts, as you might imagine, were earlier in the likes of Africa and Europe and later in places that were colonised more recently, like, um, for example, New Zealand, which was only colonised by industrial people 1,500 years ago. So <clears throat> in detecting change, modern ecologists will use what's called a batchy design, before or after control impact. Uh, <clears throat> and that allows you to have a control uh, and you measure it or two sites beforehand, and then one of those you impact to determine the magnitude of the response to a particular impact. But of course, as the previous slide suggests, nearly all ecosystems in the world have been impacted at the beginning of a monitoring program. So batchy designs generally have no B at all. They just have an after. Uh, so determining the impact of any human uh, uh, pressure is, is very difficult indeed. Uh, and it's difficult to isolate the sites from other forces. So you could try and experimentally detect the impact of nutrients, but it might be a whole lot of other impacts, as I showed in an earlier slide, that might be also contributing. It might also be the major contributor to change. And it also assumes that at the start of the study, the system is in equilibrium and not responding to some historical pressure, such as floods in the 1960s, for example, or deforestation in the 1920s. So the way we can get B back before is through paleoecology. Uh, we can look at the past through sediment records that archive fossils of past condition. And as you can see, um, and I've looked like that up in the Dieng Plateau, uh, as well as here in the Western Victorian Plains down near Melbourne. The most recognizable Paleo record, anybody seen this before? Anybody know of the hockey stick? Okay, well, this is one of the most famous paleo reconstructions by Mike Mann. It's a 1000 year reconstruction of global temperature. Not, five, not 50 year reconstruction of global temperature or 100 year, it's a thousand year reconstruction using proxies such as corals and lake sediments uh, and the like, uh, they can determine which species are responding or to or which chemicals are responding to temperature and reconstruct temperature over time uh, from these records. I chatted to Mike Mann, who was the original architect of this uh, <clears throat> in London in 2006, and he said there were three people in his audience that follow him around the world, asking him difficult questions about this, and they were funded by the petro uh, industry. So clearly this was having a significant impact because of the database that he'd put together uh, and the detail of the data systems that were enabling him to reconstruct temperature over this long period of time. Here, this is now global under pages 2K. So there's also an Asia 2K. So there's 1500 years of temperature reconstruction uh, for Asia under this sort of model under the past global changes program. So we can put in context the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and I think there are fewer people subscribing um, to the suggestion that climate change is no longer real, particularly those in the Mediterranean, Canada, US, and other places this northern summer. Uh, <clears throat> we can also reconstruct vegetation. It's very difficult to know what the vegetation used to be like if you want to restore it because it's gone, you can't see it there, but we can reconstruct vegetation from fossil pollen grains. Uh, and using databases, we can infer the production of various plants into the site of deposition in the swamp here. Uh, and that allows us to reconstruct the vegetation from the po pollen preserved in the sediments. Uh, and here's a good example here. This is a transect from about 1500 meters up to 4,000 metres in the New Guinea highlands. And somebody's walked all the way up that altitude and collected modern pollen rain out uh, from the bottom, every 100 metres altitude to the top, and has calibrated that against the vegetation in those locations. 
though not surprisingly, the grasslands here down the bottom of this hill are dominated by grass pollen. Uh, but not always. Some species are widespread because they're spread by wind. Uh, the pollen's spread by wind. So it enables you through these databases to calibrate the spread of pollen and it helps you interpret your pollen record. You can do the same with charcoal if you want to learn about fire history. This is particularly critical, I would imagine, in, in the US and Canada at the moment, because they think they're in unprecedented fire climates. Similarly, in Australia, we're trying to reconstruct pre-European fire histories to determine uh, the role of fire with traditional owners. And there's a global fire database where several thousand records of charcoal around the world have been assembled so that we can understand the relationship at a global scale between temperature, rainfall, vegetation, humans, and fire. And it's really only through this global synthesis using data systems that we can understand fire and people at a global scale. So we have a pollen record, for example, in Western Victoria, and we can look at climate and people uh, over this time, people were living here, and we have in the glacial, we had lots of grass and salt bush, and then she oak took over, and then Australia's famous eucalyptus took over when it became warmer and wetter, as you can see in the top of that diagram. So we can see quite substantial changes in vegetation when most people think today that everything was just gum trees. It wasn't just always gum trees. It's been diverse over space, our vegetation, and Australian vegetation has been diverse through time in response to climate and fire. It also tells us a little bit about um, <coughs> recovery or restoration. This species, as you can see, was quite common in the early days and has gradually disappeared. That's the she-oak. And if we're going to restore the landscape, it's the she-oak perhaps, because it's the one that's obviously uh, been lost more than any of the others uh, that we need to restore. We can see here in Australia, because of agriculture, grasses have increased dramatically, whether that be cereal grasses or weedy grasses. <clears throat> and we can use this <clears throat> once we understand the pollen and the climate to actually reconstruct past climate. Uh, and this is an example of work from near Melbourne and Myrna McKenzie uh, managed to reconstruct the temperature and the rainfall uh, 6,000 years ago, quantitatively by understanding what the requirements were for of Southern Beach, North of Vegas. And back in 6,000 years ago, the minimum temperature was slightly warmer and the hot summer temperature was slightly cooler. And so uh, Dothophagus was more widespread than it is today. It's contracted since. And if you, again, put those data systems together at a regional scale, you can reconstruct vegetation in Australia over time. 18,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and 3,000 years ago. And so you can see the adaptability of the vegetation to climate change, and it may help you predict what's going to happen in the future as climates get warmer and in the Australian situation, drier. Data systems are used in wetlands. Uh, this is my focus. Uh, essentially, to understand how systems change, you need an indicator, and you need to calibrate that indicator to a water quality parameter, whether that be salinity or nutrients or pH and you go and collect modern diatoms and you calibrate statistically that data set to let's say salinity then you take your diatoms in the fossil record in the sediment core and apply that technology in reverse and you can reconstruct salinity for thousands of years into the past putting context to the present state and better understanding the historical drivers so one of the best examples in the world is in both Northern Europe and North America. Here in uh, Wales, we can see a change in diatoms in the fossil record, in the sediment core, through time. 
using this series of samples from a six, 60 centimetre core through to the top. And you can see this species has come in here. Using this transfer function approach, uh, we can reconstruct pH over the last 300 years. So before the Industrial Revolution, a pH of about six, a little bit of a wobble, and then down to four and a half. And anything below five kills fish. So you have a significant change occurring in this site. And it's coincident with a lot of other indicators of, of human impact, lead, zinc smelting, and carbon particles. And if we look at another site, a similar but somewhat different decline in pH from six down to just below five. And what they managed to do in uh, the UK is look at multiple cores across a region. And they ran that decline in pH in each of these records. You can see some turning off to the left with lower pH and others sort of even increasing to some degree. And these numbers here reflect the amount of calcium in the catchment. And it's the calcium that buffers the acid rain that's causing this drop in pH. Uh, so they're able to demonstrate, therefore, that it was acid rain that was causing the fall. Uh, it was only those sites with high calcium that were protected. And believe it or not, that was sufficient evidence using these databases to uh, convince Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of the UK, to change their uh, energy policy, uh, just linking environment through to energy for a moment. Uh, the Murray-Darling Basin is somewhere I work. Uh, there's recent recognition that it needs more water and our Murray-Darling Basin Plan is worth $13 billion over 10 years, the biggest investment environmental remediation in Australia's history. And it is true that uh, that we, uh, the top panel shows increase in uh, abstraction or take for irrigation agriculture. And most of the increase in the top panel happened when there's a lot of blue down the bottom panel. So when there was a lot of rainfall through the uh, 50s, 60s and 70s in the Murray-Darling Basin, we got all excited and we diverted all that water and created an enormous irrigation industry. And the irrigation industry takes as much as 80% of the flow nowadays uh, and yet suddenly we found ourselves in a drought regime, a DDR, and we're massively overexposed to the overcommitment we've made to irrigation. And scarily, the last drought dominated regime lasted 50 years. Uh, and so we need to, we're, we're under great pressure in terms of working out how to allocate our water in present day resources. But I would contend if you look at other indicators, it might not just be the volume of water, which is a limiting problem. This is one of the great rivers of uh, the Murray-Darling Basin, believe it or not, the Lachlan River, and it's seriously polluted with fine sediments. There's no light regime there for plants to grow at all. And you can see the source of the sediments down the river system, erosion from sheep grazing and the like at very high rates. Uh, and attached to that clay, uh, every tonne of sediment has uh, three kilograms of phosphate. So it also drives a eutrophication issue. Sedimentation rates in wetlands are between one and five centimetres a year. So they're filling up uh, rapidly, a bit like Rawa Pening, I suspect. Uh, and we're seeing here a core that's one metre 60 is 60 years old. So uh, that wetland, which is a significant site, it's a Ramsar site, will be filled up with sediment in 10 or 20 years if we're projecting. And the ecological consequences is that the uh, diatoms are showing a loss of aquatic plants, habitat for fish and high productive plants being replaced by over in the left-hand panel, deep turbid systems that are dominated by phytoplankton. And that's not driven by lack of water, that's driven by sediments and nutrients in the system. That's driven a, a habitat loss where we have epiphytic species, those that grow around plants have disappeared. 
and that's not only in plankton, but also uh, in diatoms rather, but also in small crustaceans, Daphnia, which are correlated using these databases here uh, to the abundance of aquatic plants. And so if you do your original database uh, establishment, you can infer change um, using these sorts of models. And they've demonstrated here that <clears throat> these ones have retained their plants. And these are the uh, small wetlands, depth area on the left, and depth. And the shallow wetlands have also retained their plants. The ones that have lost their plants up here are the large, deep ones. And that's because they've lost the light regime because of the turbidity. Uh, and so they've lost all their plants and drifted across into a phytoplankton state. And we can see when we look at the pollen and the macrofossils that things like um, typha or bulrush or cattail, it might be called, uh, expands in these systems, as do various floating plants at the expense of lots of other plants that live in the water. If you're in the bottom of the wetland, you need to be able to see the light to be able to continue growing. And they're the plants that are vulnerable. And the cause is again, not necessarily water volume, but light regime. Uh, and we've seen what's happened is the small fish species that require the aquatic plants to hide because we have some fish in the Murray-Darling Basin that are two meters long, uh, they need hiding places. And so the plants or loss of plants means that they've all become critically threatened. Uh, and we can not only get that from the fossil record, but we could also get it from old transcripts of early expeditioners that arrived in the 1850s across this region, finding multiple species of fish where there are none today. <clears throat> so we can document the past and the present. Uh, I'll move through here. This database suggests there might be two mechanisms for this change. One might be just ongoing dosing of sediments. And the other might be it's a critical transition. And we can use uh, a state of change technology databases to determine whether it's a critical transition or whether it's just a continual dosing of pollutants, uh, which I suspect is most likely. Now we've, we've taken cores in 70 sites down the Murray system now. And so we can begin with that sort of data set to analyze regional scale change versus local change. And here we have um, with uh, the first 60 sites at least, 100% um, of the wetlands have changed. 80% due to sediments, 48% due to nutrients, and 34% due to salinity across hundreds of river kilometers from the top of the river system to the bottom. So it's not just about water volume, there are other major drivers that are impacting these ecosystems. And you can see an orange acidified wetland um, there. Yep, won't be long. And we can use that database of 70 sites to understand which sites have switched and which sites haven't. Somewhat like the work earlier that I showed you of Ogden. Uh, and again, here we're showing that the vulnerable ones are these large deep wetlands that switch from plants to phytoplankton permanently. We can look at some of these wetlands and see which one have got records that go beyond 100 or 200 years. And these ones have all got records of 1,000 years or more. So these are the permanent wetlands in the system. But these ones have only got records of 100 years. So they only started accumulating sediment when the system was regulated. <coughs> what that means is their natural state was intermittent or seasonal. And having become permanent with regulation, uh, the turbidity has impacted on the plants and they've become degraded ecologically. So here, in fact, we're saying some of these wetlands have got too much water. We need to let them wet and dry and that allows the plants to reset, to restore the ecosystems for the small bodied fish to persist. So we have some lessons from the past. What is the range of natural variability? You can only tell with these high amplitude 
and, and low frequency changes if you have decades, if not centuries of time? Uh, is it outside its natural range? What ecological assets have we lost from the past? What were the original drivers of change and have they been uh, supplanted by others? What are the trajectories of change? Is it stable? Is it increasing or decreasing? And is restoration possible and what measures we should we apply? And increasingly, we can only determine these from records that span a century or more. The need for numbers, data systems. We need statisticians and data analysts. Um, people can manage large databases um, because it provides us with the time depth. Spatial replication, as in the example of the Scottish and Welsh lakes, indicator calibration, whether it be pollen or diatoms or crustaceans, and correlation with causative factors to demonstrate the cause and effect and not just, uh, not just correlation. Okay. So these databases are critical. Last slide. Um, and I want to just finish on one example of why uh, <clears throat> we make mistakes when we only use one site and one indicator. This is the wetland down the bottom, at the bottom of the Murray-Darling Basin, Burundi wetland. And somebody remembered it in the 1950s to be open water. Well, 1956 was one of the biggest floods in history down the Murray-Darling Basin, and most of the basin was underwater. But a lot of community members were convinced that that's the natural system. And they, some wanted fish for deep water, some wanted shallow water for duck hunting, uh, but they certainly wanted water. But the diatom stratigraphy showed that that wetland had been a marsh for 2000 years. Uh, grown with plants all over it like that for 2000 years. But somebody was convinced it needed to be open water on account of the one record from 1956. You wouldn't be surprised with what they did. They got a, a, a backhoe and created an open water wetland by digging out uh, 100 metres by 100 metres, two metres deep of sediment. And they thought they were reconstructing that wetland when in fact uh, they were uh, artificially degrading it. So they were misguided because they didn't have that long-term record uh, of evolution of this wetland. And if they did, they would have left it as it was rather than implementing the wrong, wrong sort of uh, uh, implementation in a false um, thought that they were actually restoring the system. So uh, the long-term record is critical and databases are the best way to understand systems at scale, both in time and in space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give applause to Dr. Peter. Yeah. yeah, we can see from uh, Professor Peter uh, presentation that uh, there was an ecosystem change and we can learn from the past how to reconstruct again the environments, uh, environments uh, right now. Okay. Uh, also, uh, please keep uh, the questions and we will come to that after all the speakers are finished uh, with the presentation. Now we come to uh, third uh, presenter, uh, Prof. Alfonso. He's still with us. Or... Yeah. Prof. Alfonso? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> Sorry for waiting. Don't worry. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, you can start the presentation now. Thank you very much. Um, and again, uh, for the invitation for this presentation, I, I will speak now. Uh, about uh, a topic uh, I really like and work uh, for a long time. Uh, I will speak about emerging and emerging viruses uh, and associated factors and, and, and mitigation. I will try uh, to address uh, quickly the following the following topics. Uh, I will talk about the social environmental overview in, in Latin America to explain uh, the, the area where I have been working uh, the, this uh, this uh, group of diseases 
the importance of climate change, which is in, in, in connection with the previous presentation, the One Health approach and determinants, what is happening with some arboviruses, uh, some other viruses that are uh, emerging in, in, in the area, such as the case of mammarina viruses and also hantaviruses. What happened with the co circulation during COVID pandemic and some conclusions about the uh, mitigation? Uh, obviously, when we talk about um, arbovital diseases as well, or tropical diseases, uh, social and environmental uh, aspects are, are really important. And this is our, these are, are the, the typical areas where, for example, transmission of dengue, chikungunya, Zika, for example, here in Latin America, uh, tends to occur. Uh, and in fact, there are many definitions uh, for emerging and re-emerging conditions, but many of them, in fact, are also uh, zoonotic conditions. And this is also important because it's related to complex uh, transmission cycles. And in fact, as uh, has been experienced over the last uh, few years, particularly uh, with the um, COVID pandemic and very recently monkeypox, uh, most of the public health emergencies of international concern, as you may see, are zoonotic diseases, including also avian or swine uh, uh, flu or uh, influenza, Ebola, Zika, among others. So this is very uh, interesting and important. And it has been, for example, the cases of, of coronaviruses that had been in different animal, wild animal species, but even infecting um, uh, domestic um, uh, farm and uh, zoo animals. And right now, uh, as has been exposed uh, after the um, uh, COVID pandemic, the question is, uh, is, is not uh, if we will have or not a, 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 a new pandemic. That's not the question. In fact, uh, uh, the question is when will be the next pandemic because that's for sure we will have. There are multiple factors that are related to this, the climate change, migration, deforestation, contamination, the travel and, and migration. And in fact, in the past, other coronaviruses, but not only coronaviruses, but other um, emerging viruses have been associated with the different uh, emerging uh, conditions, uh, outbreaks, and even the, the pandemic. And the problem sometimes, uh, as uh, this recent paper highlighted that we published a, a few weeks uh, ago is that, uh, for example, some of these conditions also led to chronic uh, consequences. And this is the case of the long COVID-19 that is related to multiple uh, conditions, even uh, the development of the diabetes, uh, the pancreas injury, uh, neurological uh, chronic consequences, including headache, uh, fatigue, uh, memory loss, among uh, many other things. And these are part of the problems of, of these emerging conditions. Uh, and there are new uh, issues related to them. This is, for example, the case of um, monkeypox that uh, re-emerged last year after decades affecting Africa. And in the case of monkeypox, now also uh, uh, being associated with sexual contact, not uh, particularly for the sexual transmission uh, through fluids, but particularly the close contact during uh, sex but also the possibility of uh, the transmission to domestic uh, animals has uh, occurred firstly uh, during August uh, last year in, in France that was uh, documented in this paper in Lancet. So many uh, social and environmental issues are related to these complex um, transmission cycles that may involve humans, animals, but also vectors such as is the case of, especially of mosquitoes uh, such as iris and many other uh, arthropods. In this context, it's important to highlight that the relationship between environment, human and animals should be specifically addressed and that's part of the One Health approach that is, um, you know, trying to integrate the human health, the animal health and the environmental health. Uh, this is particularly um, relevant in the context of the climate change, which now for many emerging diseases is uh, contributing in change, for example, in the incubation periods of the, the certain pathogens, the transmission season, and uh, especially the distribution. And this has been especially the case of arboviral diseases, viruses transmitted by 
arthropods. Uh, in addition, not only the vectors bore, uh, but uh, different animal reservoirs, uh, which is also important for many uh, rodent borne uh, diseases, including not only viral, but for example, leptospirosis, uh, plague, among other. I am part of the, of the um, uh, IPCC for the health component. And in fact, it, it, this has been addressed specifically for many of the uh, assessment report uh, for impacts at adaptation and vulnerability. And last year that the, the IPCC uh, published uh, this last assessment, this has been highlighted from different um, evidence uh, in different regions of, of the world. I, I specifically participate in the development for South and Central America. And in fact, uh, many uh, emerging diseases, including uh, rodent borne and vector borne diseases are uh, related to this. But also the social conditions are key. Social conditions uh, are important for the vulnerability to many of the these emerging and emerging conditions. And now it's especially important uh, other aspects, including migration, including the, the problem with uh, uh, internal displacement, but also the refugees. Here in Latin America, there is a particular situation with Venezuela that has led to the highest number of uh, uh, international refugees, uh, not only in, in the region, but globally. Uh, more than 6 million people that had uh, left uh, that country. And this is also associated with different conditions, measles, malaria, um, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, and many even uh, uh, vaccine preventable diseases that over the last few years has been associated with different outbreaks. This has been the uh, case of the genotype D8 that has been uh, spread in the region because of this since uh, 2017. But uh, there are other even risks related to these uh, problems that are associated not only with migration, but the decrease in the, in the um, vaccination coverage. Uh, this is very recently published last, last month in Lancet uh, Regional Health that we published on this situation in, in Peru here in Latin America, because uh, due to the decrease in polio vaccination, also some vaccine derived polio case have reemerged in Peru as well, also in, in Venezuela. In the specific case of uh, the vector borne disease, we have worked with the WHO, and this is a publication from uh, some years ago, trying uh, to highlight the importance of multi-sectorial approach to the prevention and control of uh, vector borne diseases, such as is the case not only of dengue, chikungunya, but non-viral uh, vector borne diseases, such, such as the case of malaria, uh, leishmaniasis, among uh, many others. And again, it's very important, these determinants, including economic and social determinants, uh, uh, environmental and agro, uh, ecological determinants in uh, the control, the effective control of diseases. In the case of Europe, there have been uh, very interesting examples over the last uh, few years, highlighting the impact of climate change and in fact, autochthonous transmission, not only imported cases, but autochthonous transmission of these uh, diseases such as dengue, uh, chikungunya and Zika in different countries such as France, uh, Italy, among others. And that's the problem because these are uh, prone conditions for the uh, spreading of the vector, EDIS, that even uh, not only in Europe, but for example, here in, 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 in the Americas, specifically in North, in North America, is highly distributed. Uh, different species, such as the case of Edis aegypti or Edis albopictus, are important. But uh, over the last few years, a third vector has been also important here that is important, in fact, in other regions of the world, uh, in some Asian countries, such as is the case of Edis litatus, that right now is also uh, present here. And these are vectors that different studies have shown that are competent for the transmission of dengue, chikungunya, Zika, among others. Over the last uh, few years, we have other problems, and this has been specifically the case of chikungunya, in addition to other vector-borne uh, diseases uh, of uh, viral etiology here in the region that some of them are shared with uh, Asia, such, such as is the case of dengue, Zika, or um, the case of, of chikungunya that is highly distributed all, all over the world. 
after December 2013, we had this situation also here in Latin America with the distributions. Here are some of our articles uh, published in, in Lancet, uh, Lancet infectious diseases. And we had a significant spread of the uh, Asian urban uh, genotype and the exa and zootic genotype, especially in Brazil. And obviously this is part of the distribution of the vectors in the tropical areas, including here, for example, in, in Indonesia, but different re, uh, countries in, in other regions, such as the case of Africa and uh, here, obviously in, in Latin America. And we have the problem of overlapping of many of these emerging diseases. Uh, um, this was the case, for example, here in Colombia, in areas that were prone for dengue, then later it became also prone, obviously, for the transmission of chikungunya and Zika. And we have not only the co-circulation and the sequential um, infections, but also the possibility of simultaneous uh, co-infection between these, uh, for example, uh, arboviral diseases. And even with other tropical pathogens, uh, for example, leptospirosis, malaria, among others that uh, may even lead uh, to uh, fatal outcomes that has been described uh, in different cases uh, we have published. Uh, and unfortunately, these became endemic. And this is the situation here in Colombia that all of them are already endemic after uh, its introduction a few years ago. Now we have the, a, a significant set of prevalence for these uh, different arboviral diseases. Right now, there is a, a regional concern regarding not only dengue, but the re-emergence of chikungunya, especially over the last uh, year and uh, in 2022, but right now also in 2023. Over the last uh, few weeks of this year, there has been a significant increase in the number of cases, particularly in the South Kong of uh, the Americas, in countries such as the case of Paraguay, but also in Argentina, Uruguay, and Bolivia, with a significant increase in areas that were not before endemic for chikungunya. Right now, probably the most affected country in the region is Argentina, with thousands of cases, and the problem that chikungunya may lead not only to acute cases, but also to chronic condition. And it's important the differential diagnosis with other arboviral diseases, which is a complex in terms of the overlapping uh, clinical manifestations. But the problem that we had a lot, a plethora of different arboviral diseases that also include Mayaro, Madariaga, San Luis, uh, encephalitis virus, uh, Rocio virus, Oropuche, among other that have uh, emerged uh, in the region with uh, overlapping in, in certain uh, clinical manifestations. And with COVID-19 and monkeypox, there are also overlapping in certain clinical uh, manifestations. But as I mentioned, the possibility to tend to produce also chronic disease. And this has been particularly the case of uh, chikungunya that has been documented not only for the um, severe uh, consequences that may have in, in some patients, even with uh, fatal outcomes, but the problems even affecting um, the, the, the pregnancy and the possibility of congenic, congenital disease that is not only reported in Zika, but also uh, in chikungunya, and the possible uh, chronic uh, consequences even impacted uh, in the uh, neurocognitive of common of children that has been uh, exposed uh, perinatally to chikungunya. But right now, there, there's a, a, a secondary epidemic of chronic chikungunya that has been associated with the previous epidemics we had here in Latin America. And this was uh, reported first in the, uh, in the Indian, uh, in the Ocean Indian, uh, because of, of the epidemic in La Reunion, uh, Iceland, uh, or France. But right now, also here in Latin America, where a, a significant proportion of patients will have a chronic condition, especially affecting um, the joints, affecting the quality of line of, of, of patients, but also uh, many other, uh, not only joint and, and periarticular um, findings, but even systemic uh, manifestations. Additionally, we have 
other uh, condition that they still are a matter of concern. And this is the case, for example, of yellow fever. This is endemic in, in Latin America, but also in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But now, due to travel, have been presented with imported cases, not only in North America and Europe, but also imported cases in, in China have been uh, reported over the, over the last uh, decade. Uh, and this is a vaccine preventable disease, but uh, disease, but uh, uh, unfortunately, in some countries, such as is the case of Venezuela, have reemerged because of the lack uh, of vaccination. And during this year, uh, other uh, countries in the region, such as is the case particularly of Brazil, have reported also cases. Additionally, other arboviral diseases that are a matter of concern is the case of the a, a, a equine encephalitis viruses, including the Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, but also the uh, Eastern uh, encephalitis and the Western uh, encephalitis, in addition to other well-known um, virus, which is uh, the case of uh, West Nile uh, encephalitis uh, virus. Uh, and this uh, um, 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 equine encephalitis is endemic in, in, in multiple countries in Latin America. For example, these are the, the areas we have mapped for the case of the Venezuelan and the Eastern uh, again, encephalitis. And this is also uh, important for the risk uh, of transmission to humans as these are also a zoonotic uh, condition. In addition to that, we have a lot of um, uh, arena viruses. We have endemic arena viruses here such as is the case, uh, uh, for example, of Lassa fever, which is endemic in Africa, but not endemic in Latin, in Latin America. But we have here viruses, such as is the case of Junín or Guanarito that are responsible of the Argentinian and the Venezuela, uh, Venezuelan hemorrhagic fever. We have also the Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, which is caused right now by two different viruses, which is uh, Machupo and uh, recently, described virus uh, in the last couple decades, which is called Chapare. And this uh, has been uh, causing, as you see here, multiple outbreaks uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, few years. This is the new one, Chapare, that was uh, described uh, in 2007 in, in Bolivia, in this area called Chapare. And here is the area of Machupo with uh, uh, another virus that has been described. And in 2019, there was causing this uh, new virus, a new outbreak of this uh, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, which is associated with the distribution of uh, different rodent um, um, reservoirs and, and, and uh, animals that have been associated with the, with the transmission, especially in rural areas. And this has been, this has been well characterized uh, for the case uh, uh, of the, the transmission areas. And finally, we have also in Brazil, one uh, uh, arenavirus, which is, uh, the arenavirus are now called mammaronaviruses uh, due to the recent taxonomical changes, uh, which is the case of Savia. Savia is the theological agent, uh, Savia virus of the Brazilian hemorrhagic fever that has been also causing some sporadic um, cases in, uh, especially in the, in the case of Brazil. But we have also other important rodent uh, uh, born viruses, not only these mammarina viruses, but this is the case of hantaviruses or orthohantaviruses that has been also important in different countries in, in Latin America, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Bolivia. Uh, and um, um, some outbreaks have been uh, recently reported, uh, for example, in Bolivia, and some change in the clinical presentation of these viruses has been also reported uh, regarding the possibility not only to affect uh, the lung and causing the Hanta uh, pulmonary uh, syndrome, but also the possibility of having a renal failure and proteinuria, which is more associated with the Hanta viruses that uh, are circulated for are circulating, uh, for example, in, in, in the case of Asia. Uh, it's interesting also um, that during COVID pan pandemic, we have uh, a lot of problems, not only for the differential diagnosis, but also the possibility of co-infection. And this was the case initially for some sporadic cases, uh, for example, between 
SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and dengue, but later uh, with uh, a significant uh, number of cases that uh, have been described. And this is part of the, the uh, recent systematic review we published la last year in New Microbes and New Infection, describing the countries where this situation uh, has uh, occurred uh, regarding this co-infection. Also, last year, we had uh, not only Latin America, but globally, more than 100 countries that were affected uh, by monkeypox. This has been uh, very important for some of them. In fact, some of the countries more affected are here in Latin America, such as is the case of Brazil, uh, Colombia, and Peru, with thousands of, of cases. And these affect especially some uh, population and race, especially uh, the LGBTI groups, uh, people living with uh, HIV. And we have published some um, uh, studies regarding the, the clinical presentation of, of these uh, re-emerging monkeypox here uh, in, in Latin America. Additionally to all, to all of this, recently there have been uh, a significant concern regarding animal uh, influenza, especially avian influenza. And this is also a, a matter of discussion and, uh, and recent research. So to conclude, uh, we, had, uh, we have been in a constant threat of uh, the zoonotic and vertebral um, emerging tropical diseases as we, we publish in different uh, articles, uh, including editorials and, and, and review. And right now, it's important to think on, on, on the possibilities also to uh, provide mitigation to this situation. We have certainly an, an evolving epidemiology of uh, all and new flows who, of, of a, a emerging and emerging different uh, vital, but also other kind of pathogens with uh, prone social and environmental conditions for transmission, obviously, these emerging or emerging conditions uh, um, affects the most vulnerable populations. Also, it's important to consider the impact uh, this has uh, um, uh, associated with the so socio-political crisis, uh, migration, including Force One, refugees going north, south, and beyond, including Europe and abroad. Uh, it's, it's important. In the Middle East, uh, the case of Ukraine, for example, with the word. And obviously there is more cause circulation of different uh, emerging or emerging patterns, the possibility of co-infections, not just the differential diagnosis. And there is a clear need uh, for enhanced surveillance, including for the case of uh, arboviral, but other uh, vector-borne diseases, a more uh, entomological surveillance, lab diagnosis improving the need uh, for more available molecular tools, including genomic, uh, sequencing and the uh, preparedness, uh, an appropriate response for this uh, situation. I would like to conclude um, also remembering uh, something that is interesting from the book of Bill Gates, Bill Gates, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic. As I mentioned before, the question is not uh, if we will have more pandemics, the question is when we should be more prepared, the system, the healthcare workers, the society, we may control it, but uh, we need more, tool to, uh, more tools to avoid um, uh, another uh, pandemic that can be uh, another catastrophe. And for that, it's important to consider finally to improve the health systems in the world, improve the surveillance for different pathogens, even for the new one, which is uh, especially important, and to improve, uh, to have uh, innovation at detection, treatment, and prevention of this disease, including uh, more vaccines, which is a, a key matter uh, in this, especially having a, a rapid development as occurred uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, but even um, uh, faster uh, has been recently uh, proposed after the, the pandemic. In this perspective article at the New England Journal of Medicine for the possibility of delivering pandemic vaccines in 100, in 100 days, which has been very detailed in the, in the proposal in, in this article. I would like to conclude just inviting, inviting all, all the people in my presentations to our Colombian Congress of Infectious Diseases, which will be the next month in Santa Marta Beach here in Colombia. And thank you very much for your attention. And as the poet 
Luciano García Gómez here in Pereira, Colombia sets. In Pereira, there are no foreigners. We are all Pereirans. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Prof. Alfonso, for your uh, inspiring talk. Uh, now we come to uh, question answer sessions. Uh, I will give uh, two sessions for this QA. And for the first session, I will let three questions from the audience. Please state your names and also uh, uh, to whom your question is addressed. Please. Okay, one. Two, three. Okay, please. Well, thank you very much. I'm Iwan Puranta. I'm a student of first graduate from Dr. Uh, the Well, uh, I've got uh, many information, the great information. Thanks for the moment. And I want to ask to Prof. Nur Jafar. Your topic very imagine. Well, I have a question. Uh, how do technology development such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, and Internet of Things contribute to crystallize of the economic using ICT? Yes. Such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, how the effect of that went to the economic side from fintech, financial technology? Uh, I hope I get the question right. So you're asking how does artificial intelligence, IoT? Yes. yes. How the technology development to... such as artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. blockchains, and the Internet of Things contribute to crystallize of digital economy? Okay. So how do these technologies actually yes. uh, catalyzing the digital economy? Yeah. So yes. when you have these um, tools, we call it tools to make things um, more efficient and faster. So you can see that um, the way that we move forward with regards to uh, having to convert what is in the form of beads into atom, and this can actually be measured in terms of monetary. Okay, for example, um, when you talk about ride sharing or platform like Uber, Grabs, those kind of things, uh, you convert those services into um, the things that you enjoy, right? So how much you actually pay and uh, how much it actually can contribute to the economy with regards to um, the sales that it actually generates. That's how you can see with the tools that you have mentioned earlier, things are moving forward and that actually impact the economic growth of a country. Okay. okay. Did I answer you yes. correctly? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, okay, second question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to ask to Professor Noor. Um, I was wondering, Professor, uh, how do you respond <clears throat> to the digitalization process for service product from the government to the community? For example, public innovation in Indonesia, Malaysia, relates to improving to digital economy. Okay, that's a first question. Oh, you have more than one question, uh, is it? It's just two questions. <laughs> and then um, in the picture so early you shared before, uh, it's look, digitalization makes confidence easier. Somehow, time feels very fast and there's no limit. Isn't right? Are the current working time rules essential right now? How do you respond about that? Thank you. I actually get, got lost a little bit. Maybe the first one with regards to government, yeah, right? The, yes. The first, the first question is about how do you respond about the innovation governments related to the digital economy? And the second question is how about the current working time rules right now? Time rules? It's like, you know, uh, working time, eight hours each day, five day workers. What do you think about that? Because in your pictures, you share that 
time is very fast and somehow it's no limits about how to working okay. eight hours in day each day all right uh, maybe you. i can address your first questions with regards to government innovation Appreciate. right right uh, how does government are you talking about what is the role of the government yes or uh, to actually enhance innovation yes to elevate the uh, uh, okay. digital economy especially now, in indonesia uh, and malaysia uh, of course, when you talk about uh, government support with regards to enhancing um, the strength of the community, how they actually move forward from what we call the physical revolution up to the industrial 4.0 or, for example, IR 4.0. And now we are moving to what we call the society 5.0. We require government uh, assistance, right? So the role of government is very much important with regards to providing platforms and infrastructure. If you don't have the mandate or if you don't have the um, capabilities to actually uh, provide this infrastructure, you will not achieve the digital economic status as what you have planned, right? So the role of uh, government is very important and innovation, um, I think in most countries, uh, the government promotes innovation to happen um, in the society, in the organizations. So they have come up with certain programs they have come up also with certain uh, financial or even grants assistance to actually foster innovations. Yeah, so um, that I would say how government can actually assist. And uh, maybe in Indonesia, some maybe some of you can actually also enlighten us with regards to what are the programs that the government has done with regards to improving the ICT infrastructure. All right, so that's. My answer for your first question. Second question is with regards to the impact, I would say, to the working environment, working, working hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Normally, we work about eight hours a day. And um, nowadays, we don't work only eight hours, right? We can work 20 hours, 24. maybe. <laughs> you only sleep maybe about four hours or even minimum six hours. Uh, other than that, 18 hours, you go and find alternative ways to generate income. Yeah. So the impact would be, um, the choice is yours. You can still opt to work eight hours per day. But if you think um, there are opportunities and you require additional monetary um, rewards, for example, you can opt to work as a gig workers, you know, something that can actually be done anyway, right? Um, as a matter of fact, if I were to actually be here and I have another, you know, assignment elsewhere, I have another business, for example, maybe in Thailand, in, uh, you know, uh, Japan, for example, even though I'm here, my business can actually still work, right? So that is more interesting right now. So there is no boundary with regards to where do you need to be in order for you to work. All right, so the choice is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Okay, the third questions. Thank you very much. My question for Prof. Peter. My question is how to different climate change fluent the environment, the atom, or degrad degrading environment influence eclipse change? How, how to different eclipse change influence the environment, the atom, or degrading environment influence eclipse change? We are uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Bagaimana uh, membedakan Prof uh, pengaruh perubahan iklim terhadap lingkungan atau lingkungan yang mempengaruhi terhadap uh, atau lingkungan yang mempengaruhi terhadap perubahan iklim? Uh, 
Uh, I think the question is, um, does the natural environment influence the climate or is the climate influencing the natural environment? Yes. I'll just work, uh, answer with respect to wetlands. Uh, certainly wetlands are a product of climatic uh, conditions, but that's mediated by the environment. So that, um, for example, if you're in a particular climate, um, you don't always have the same wetlands. A wetland that is open will lose all its salt and it will be fresh. A wetland that is closed will not lose its salt and it will gradually become saline. So you can have fresh and saline wetlands in the same climate. Um, in terms of that environment influencing the climate, uh, there is certainly instance at large scale, the Amazon, big African lakes, that they will influence local climates and climates downwind. Uh, so there are feedbacks both ways, but in many instances, the environment is a function of the influence of, of the climate. It's all connected, but to different degrees. Okay, thank you. Maybe this uh, question similar to which one is the first? Uh, egg or chicken? <laughs> okay, uh, I open the second session for the questions. Uh, uh, open for three questions. Yeah, first, second, and from the left wings. Okay, three, Prof. Chris. Okay, Pak Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Akung from Energy Force Graduate NC Palim. I have a question for Prof. Uh, what is the best management whenever the environmental, environmental uh, say aquatic and terrestrial already changed and have impacted on the habitat as well as social life? Which one? Yeah. It's better. Uh, the, uh, the, the restoration? Last, last bit. It was simple up until the last bit. Yeah. Uh, the, the, there is no best method. There's no best indicator. You need to begin with your question. So you, if you are addressing a large scale question or small scale question, you select your indicator or your method to answer the questions that you've set. If, if you're looking at the interaction between people, environment and climate, uh, that will be a different set of questions than if you're just looking at uh, the natural change within an environment. Uh, it would need to get up, goes up another level of complications. And in many instances, you, use, you have to use synthetic metrics to understand at that higher interdisciplinary scale because you can't measure everything. Mm. If you're measuring a single lake, you can measure lots of things directly. If you're trying to understand high level interactions, then you're dealing with syntheses uh, and metrics rather than measurements in some instance. But it always comes back to the question. You need to start with your question first and then seek the methodology that will address the questions that you've set. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, second question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Taspai from post, uh, a student from postgraduate. Uh, uh, my question goes to Prof. No. Uh, I think nowadays digital economy is practiced uh, everywhere, even though it's different from different perspectives and it can be uh, different in terms of extent level of economy development. Uh, so uh, I wonder, uh, Prof, if you give me some information about this, the role of this digital economy in developing countries, especially from Africa or Southern America, how this digital economy affects the economic development of these developing countries. Thank you. Uh, if are you looking for the um, 
indicators like what is the status of digital economy in those countries? Yeah, yeah. What's what, how? Because uh, I have seen in your presentation that especially in Southeast Asia, it can hit like oh, yeah. a trillion US dollar of the economy can be affected by this digital economy. Yeah. Uh, Do we have some information how? Okay. Yeah. Um, things are actually everywhere. When you talk about digital economy, of course, there is no country that would actually be left behind. Okay. Um, each country is trying to embark on this digital economy. Otherwise, they will not be competitive. Okay. So when you talk about the, uh, for example, the countries that you have mentioned, I don't remember exactly in terms of the contributions, the percentage to GDP, but there is a report where you can actually look for in um, OECD, for example, there is a report on digital economy, right? They have a task force that have been formed to actually address on the issue of the digital economy in each countries in the world, yeah? So you can look up for the report with regards to uh, how much uh, each country has progressed towards achieving digital economic status. Okay. Of course, again, when you talk about digital economy, there is also an indicator of what we call digital society index that actually measure to certain extent okay, how much your society have embedded uh, ICT in their uh, practices, current practices, uh, businesses, and so forth. So look for that. So this is what we call the Digital Society Index that actually measures also with regards to um, what are the indicators for digital economy. Because when you talk about digital economy achievement, we talk about to what extent the society have uh, used a lot of technology in their current practices. Yeah? Of course, there is also an indicator of what is the current level of infrastructure provided by the government. So that is part of the index also. Yeah, so um, there is a full report that is published every year. It has been updated every year in terms of the uh, percentage of the contribution to the cross domestic product of the countries. Yeah, you can look for that. So have I answered your question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Nod and Ms. Ayu. Uh, last questions, Prof. Chris. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Prof. Hadianda. <clears throat> My name is Sutresno Anguru. Allow me to ask to Prof. Peter Gill. Aleo Neo Ecology is important for the impact of mitigation, climate, and ecosystem change. My question is. How to combine paleo and neo ecology? And what are strategies to reduce the risk of climate change and ecological succession? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, you're repeating a question that Professor John Small asked in his paper in 1980. And how do we better interact between paleo and neoecology? So paleoecologists have tried to do this for four decades or possibly even, even more. Uh, and to a degree, um, it's difficult because managers in government don't have a very good perspective of time. And it's much more convenient for them to understand a story that has 10 years, which is familiar to them. However, as I've, I've pointed out, uh, the longer time frame provides a context that might tend to upend interpretations that are quite short. Um, in Australia, I'll say, and I suspect in other parts of the world, I find that environmental policy become goes before environmental science. Uh, and then the last to come in is paleoscience. And I find very often 
the paleo science upends the science, which then challenges the policy. So we tend to have it the wrong way around. And the most sensible way of doing it would be just to understand change over time, put the historians in first, and then that will direct how we um, implement shorter term experiments to understand the dynamics. And then we can inform government what's going on and the best, best policies. Uh, for mine, um, I grew up in a laboratory that wanted to go further and further and further back in time. And we were looking at hundreds of thousands of years of climate cycles. Um, managers don't think in those time frames. They have a lot of difficulty with decades, let alone centuries. So I constrain most of my work to 200 years. And I find people that are willing to uh, understand and bring that time frame to management and try and build a story. And you gradually get invited into forums where they're looking for a historical context. But um, some of the best scientists just said to me, well, we don't want the paleo because we can't go back there. Well, there are many more lessons that the paleo record can provide than just a target to go back 500 or 1,000 years. Uh, and in fact, that's the worst possible target because the further you go back, um, you could choose any possible target because of the long-term variability. So I'd stick to shorter time frames and try and work with forums that are, of people that are working in, in modern ecology for management. I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but that's what I've done so far. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul Peter. Prop Tris, satisfied. Okay. Okay, I say uh, one question over there in left wing. The last question. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I want to ask the Professor Noor uh, the, about the digital economic, but maybe in several countries, there are developing a digital economic, but without us realizing it, there are still number of area that still have many limitations such as knowledge, signal, and tools such as in rural area. In Indonesia, so many uh, have a island, so many have a rural area in Indonesia. What is your response regarding this gap? Thank you. You're talking about digital divide, uh, the gap between those who have access to technology yes. versus those who do not have access to technology. Yes. Um, I'm sure there are certain percentage of the uh, community or people in a country that would, you know, um, be participants in most of the digital economic activities. But we cannot deny the fact that there are also people who do not embark or do not actually be involved in the digital economy activities. That one we cannot avoid because like countries of in Malaysia, we have the rural areas. Even in Australia, you also have the rural areas, right? People that are living in the rural areas, okay? These people um, would have maybe limited access, if not uh, at certain par with those who are living in the more rural area, and those, uh, you know, would actually be more open or they have the opportunity to learn about using technology, right? So when you talk about digital divide, it's not only with regards to geographical location, it's only about mental, I mean, the way how you actually accept using technology. Have you ever seen, um, much, I mean, what is it? Tantar, is it? Uh, any tantal that live in the rural area having smartphone? 
Have you ever seen? You have, right? Okay. When you talk about digital divide, um, it's not really um, whether you're young, you're old. It's about whether you really accept the technology to facilitate your daily activities. Yeah. Even though you're young, but you don't have a smartphone, you cannot do anything. But if you're 65 or even 52 like myself, I have smartphone and I do things easily on the, uh, on the gadget, right? So it's digital divide, geographical versus, you know, also mental and also knowledge. Okay. Um, are you satisfied with the answer? Yeah. There, are, there is one question to Prof. Alfonso. So do, do you professor morale is not escape without a question. So <laughs> I thought okay. I would ask, um, and a little bit interdisciplinary, can you uh, provide us any insights on how uh, in increasingly intense climate events might impact on your predictability of, of outbreaks in the future, uh, including issues with respect to climate refugees? Well, there are uh, many studies uh, right now concerning uh, different future scenarios, uh, including the, the, the impact specifically of the, the climate change and the, and the forecasting for the next uh, decades. And what is expected, for example, in the case of certain viral diseases, such as is the case of, of dengue, that for example, in Europe, there will be more prone areas for the presence of the Edis albopictus, which is one of the main vectors now involved in, in the transmission of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. And uh, uh, during the uh, warm seasons, uh, especially in the, in the summer in Europe, uh, will be uh, the risk of transmission uh, in the future, now is happening. Uh, now has been described uh, uh, for the Mediterranean uh, coastal areas in, in south of France uh, or, or Spain and Italy, among other countries. But um, in the near future, in the in the predicted uh, scenarios, this will be uh, more more likely to see and with the problem of the presence of the vector and and transmission. And in addition. Uh, obviously, migration is coupled with this because sometimes what happens is that people migrating from endemic areas arrive with a disease incubated or with an acute infection in a moment where precisely there is the vector, there is the, the uh, susceptible uh, people. And this, for example, happened a few years ago with dengue in the Madeira Islands which are part of uh, Portugal in front of the coast of, uh, of, uh, of Africa. And there were the vectors, uh, there were a susceptible population and uh, Portuguese people living in Venezuela due to the socioeconomic crisis in Venezuela returned to Portugal, to Madeira, Iceland, and they bring dengue, the serotype too, and was even traced by molecular tools to to the dengue to circulating uh, circulating in Venezuela and why is associated with uh, an outbreak of dengue with local transmission due to the presence of the vector in in Madeira Island. So the the, the risk uh, for the future uh, associated with the climate change and, and migration is uh, really really important and we have to keep it keep it on uh, mind for prevention for. Uh, um, uh, surveillance and, and obviously uh, as a matter of uh, research and concern. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Alfonso. And because <laughs> the time is limited and we have to end up these uh, sessions, uh, I would like to thank to all the presenters, the speakers, Prof. Noor, Prof. Peter, Prof. Alfonso, for your time. <laughs> And also uh, your time uh, that uh, give a uh, presentation to us uh, to this conference. And I would like to thank also to the, all the idea, audience that give uh, yeah, many questions um, that makes uh, this uh, session more. Uh,
and I return uh, this time to committee. Okay. Let's give applause to the all speakers. Well, thank you to all of the keynote speaker and the moderator for your inspiring insight. We would like for all of you to stay on the stage and we invite the Dean, Mr. Erbe Sularto and Mr. Rizal as chairman to come onto the stage and give the mementos for all speakers and moderator as a sign of our gratitude. First mementos for Mr. Peter. And then second, the mementos for Prof. Noon. Also, we give a big appreciation for Mr. Alfonso as keynote speaker taking place online. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to inform you that there is a booth outside the main room. This booth is organized by Cipalim, Cluster for Paleolimnology. The Cipalim is a research community of Diponegoro University in collaboration with BRIN, our National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia. It is a leading center for Paleolim paleolimnological study as a basis for developing strategies of lake management to sustain, sustain lake function for hydropower electricity, agricultural irrigation, fisher, ecotourism, religious, sociocultural, and habitat for biota. There is an NFETS workshop on sustainable water management. They are organized by Cipalim. And this event will be held on August 15, 2023 in a hybrid mode. And if you're interested to take place to event, please contact the committee or visit the booth. Thank you. Now we will take a lunch break till 1 p.m. Following the break, all participants should process the presentation room according to the schedule.
Room 1A for information system will be in Prambanan room on the second floor. Room 1B for information system will be in Plausan room on second floor. Room 1C for environment will be in Borobudur 1 room in first floor. Room 1D for environment will be in Borobudur 2 room on first floor. Room 1A from epidemiology will be in Sewu room on second floor. Thank you. So the ICNS to 2023 participant can go outside to have lunch first before we continue our agenda. Thank you.